All right. I think we can get started. Thank you all so much for those who uh, introduced yourselves in the chat. Feel free to continue to do so for those who haven't yet, if you want, just to get to know each other a little bit better. But for now, let's get started. Um, I can do a quick introduction of myself. My name is Ben, and I am calling you guys currently from New York City. I am a graduate of Minerva University, uh, class of 2020, and I'm also now the outreach associate for Minerva, which means it's my job to share the experience I've had at Minerva. And today I'm here to give you guys and present to you guys a workshop that I wish I had when I was in high school. It's called Design Your Ideal College Workshop. And I know you guys are all probably thinking a little bit about college right now. That's probably why you're here. Um, and a lot of you guys are probably getting asked questions such as, where do you want to go? What do you want to study? Which are very normal questions. I have, was asked that many times in high school as well. But I wish somebody asked me what I wanted out of college, which I know is implied, but it's never actually the question. And today we're going to use a framework to help you guys think a little bit about what you actually want um, and hopefully have you guys leave with a few pointers that you can write on a piece of paper or something you can bring to your you know, counselor or teachers or parents or whoever is helping you with this process to help them do the search for you and also for you to do the search for you to see what is right. Um, and another bonus thing, I know it seems like in the child, most of you are not seniors yet, but when you are applying to universities, it's really helpful to have a good and clear and specific idea to why you want to attend that program. Because as somebody who's now working on the staff side for a university and college, I can tell you that it's really helpful for you to be able to be specific in your application in regards to explaining to universities and colleges why you're interested in attending their program. Um, and that's going to be really, really helpful for them to help have you stand out and for them to and for you to really look good in the application process. So um, before we dive into this workshop, I want to tell you guys just a little bit about Minerva, because that's the university that I'm representing here today and that I graduated from. Minerva, you may or may not have heard about us, but we are a very, very unique institution where our students uh, travel to seven different countries throughout four years alongside a really small, tight knit community with um, students from all over the world. I had my graduating class had 130 students from over 45 different countries. Um, and actually our curriculum is extremely unique where our students um, say goodbye to exams, tests, lectures, all our classes are discussion based, are super active. And I'm going to bring a few components of that into this session today as well. So keep those uh, fingers on your keyboard. I'm going to ask you guys to be typing into the chat a few times during the session. Um, and before we dive into the session, I have a cool little video to show you guys that I made of um, my time at Minerva. So let's just give you a quick sneak peek into the really, really cool experience I was lucky enough to have as a college experience. Oh, is it going to play? Perhaps. I think it is. All right, let's take a look. What is, what is Minerva? Well, it's a lot of things. What I can tell you is that it is not a typical undergraduate program. That's me, and that's Jess. And for the past four years, Minerva has brought us to seven different countries around the world with 150 of our closest friends, all while completing our bachelor's degrees. Four years later, we get to tell you about our stories on how the past four years have been amazing, challenging, but overall, life-changing. So, if you don't want to sit in the same lecture halls on the same campus for four whole years, if you want to not just learn about the world, but see it for yourself, if you want a challenge, come chat with us and we'll tell you all about it. All right, so that's Minerva and I'm more than happy to talk a little bit more about it at the end um, and answer any questions you have. But for now, why don't we dive into this session? And I know I warned you guys a little bit earlier, so the next few slides, I would love for you guys to answer um, and uh, help me out with some question and answer in the chat. Um, and I'm going to start off real easy, uh, which is, I'm curious, 
what if you guys know what these are? I'll give it a few seconds. I promise it's not a trick question, but um, I'd love to know if some of you uh, have read these actually. Maybe, maybe not. Encyclopedias, I'm seeing encyclopedias. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Can you put up an emoji on your screen if you've actually read one. Yeah, I see Jay's read it. Okay, cool. That's pretty cool. Okay, well, if you haven't read one, that's okay. I have not either. But the reason I have this up on the screen is because um, not that long ago, just a few generations ago, I'd say probably like 70 or 80 years ago, encyclopedias was the uh, main source of information. If you guys were assigned a, a homework project or some sort of assignment, um, you would go to the library or wherever else is your nearest edition and collection of encyclopedias, and that's where you would start your research, right? Um, and it is, I think, yeah, if you ask your parents or your grandparents, they'll have a lot of stories with encyclopedias. It is definitely something that not too long ago, it was the main source of knowledge spread. And obviously compared to today, it was a lot slower, right? You couldn't just access information. And whenever there were new research that was being created, um, they would send it off to the publishing company who was publishing these encyclopedias. They would have to print them and then they would ship them around and sell them. And uh, basically whenever there was something new discovered, um, it, getting it to uh, like a day-to-day -day person's usage and knowledge, it takes a while because that was just a constraint at the time. But luckily in the middle of the 20th century, uh, a pretty big innovation was made. And so I'd love to hear from those of you again in the chat, what is this? I think you guys are a bit more familiar with this probably. Computer? Computer, yeah, yeah. Um, perfect, specifically a desktop computer. I don't know if you guys have these or currently still have them in schools, but I remember um, these were really well marked by like really big chunky things beside the screen. It takes like five full minutes to boot up and the mouse had a little ball inside of it that I would always take out. I don't know if you guys still have that common experience, but it was so much fun. But yes, you're right, it's a computer. And along with the computer came the internet. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we all now use, you know, our own um, laptops, but with the internet came a lot of changes with how information was spread, right? Um, you can now access information almost instantaneously as long as you have a computer near you. Now, at, you know, for a long time, not everyone had access to computers, but at least now in the United States, most schools um, and workplaces and homes have access to one, at least, at least one computer. And so when the computer came along, it really changed the game in regards to how information was spread and how you can access information. All right, so the next one is a lot more relevant to you guys. I'm taking multiple right answers for this one. What is this? Okay, I see Wikipedia, I see iPhone, smartphone, smartphone, cell phone with Wikipedia on it, phone. Yeah, internet. Perfect, okay, all of these correct. Um, the AirPods are just a little bonus in there, but could be relevant with podcasts and stuff now. But really the main thing I wanna focus on is that this is the newest Wik encyclopedia, right? I think when we looked at the encyclopedias for us, that was like the old Wikipedia, but for a lot of people, Wikipedia is the new encyclopedia. Um, and really that's what it was, You know, that's where the name came from. Um, and with Wikipedia in combination with our cell phones, which are now just, computers in our pockets, you can access the entire world of information instantaneously, literally at your fingertips within seconds. And that is not a surprise to any of us. That's the world we all grew up in. And that is something that is so normal for us, right? But we have to, the reason I'm showing you guys this side by side is we have to remember that the world has changed so quickly in the past few decades. And it really wasn't that long ago when something like this the ability to prove your friend wrong in an argument in an instance was just a dream, and even that's maybe not. And so the world of information has changed extremely quickly in the past few decades. However, um, higher education really hasn't, um, and the change is only going to continue. You know, in July 2020, we had 
<coughs> excuse me, billion um, internet users globally, but that's only going to increase. Um, and the world has changed so, so quickly, but higher education really hasn't. You know, universities and college programs were designed from a model that was really created in the Industrial Revolution, which was, you know, over 100 years ago. It was a long time ago. And um, but we really haven't done much innovation. And that gap where the world is moving on much, much faster than universities are is really, really uh, exacerbated in the past few decades or the past few years, really, where we see that even though 96 percent of universities um, believe that their schools are preparing students for the world of work, only about 11 percent of employers are actually agreeing. Um, and this is really not that much of a surprise to anyone. We know that you know, education can be better and must be better. And for specific, specifically for you guys, as you're looking ahead into your future at this rapidly changing world, you're probably thinking, okay, so how do I find a university education that's actually going to prepare me for my future, right? Because you're really entrusting these college programs to do so for you. And so the question goes, how do we build a university to prepare you for the future. That's what we're gonna be tackling today. And we're gonna be using this question to help you guys understand your own personal reasons for why you want uh, or what you want out of a college education. Because realistically, what each of you want is probably a little bit different. And today I'm hoping to help with a help with a framework that I'm gonna introduce in just the next slide, uh, tease that out for you guys and understand what you're actually looking for. Now, this is a huge question, obviously. How do you build a university to prepare you for the future? I mean, how do you even know what future, like what future exists? You don't know what's going to happen. If you did, it, life would be a lot easier, but unfortunately we don't. And so how can we actually predict the future or build a, uh, or build a program that can, um, you know, at least try to help future-proof your career? Um, and we luckily have a good framework that a lot of innovators use around the world called the design thinking process. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this process. Um, maybe some of you have, maybe you haven't. Um, the, the full process is a little bit longer, but we're going to take three steps of it today, and we're going to run through it step by step. And three steps today are define the goal and the problem, break it into component parts, and develop innovative solutions and rebuild. And don't worry if this seems a little bit confusing and vague. I will walk you guys through this step by step. Um, the design thinking process is really prevalent in especially Silicon Valley. It is something that a lot of our uh, sort of leading edge innovators use to really try to break down the assumptions that we hold about any given problem and try to build something creative and innovative. And actually, this was the process that the founders of Minerva get, came up with when they were creating Minerva. And Minerva was really created as a response to what I was just identifying earlier, which is that universities, even the best ones in the world today, were designed a really long time ago and they really need to step up and adapt to the world today. And so when the founders of Minerva were trying to tackle that exact question in the last slide, they utilized this framework. So as I'm walking you guys through this framework, I'm gonna be giving you guys some examples uh, or the specific example of what the university founders of Minerva and how they were answering these questions themselves. So let's dive into that first step. And I hope you guys all have something to type on or write on. This is going to be important for the next few, few steps because um, the next few questions, I'm going to need you guys to keep them, keep track of them, so because they're going to all connect, kind of connect at the very end. So um, let's dive into the first question, which is, what is the goal of college? Now, I know this is a really big question, but I want you guys to think about this very individually. I want you guys to take a few minutes, which I'll give you guys in the next slide, to think a little bit about why you even want to go to college. What do you hope to gain from this experience for yourself? I know there's a lot of societal messaging about what and what you've been told growing up about the point of college. And a lot of them is probably true, but just take a look at them, take a look at yourself and think, okay, what do I even want out of college? And write them down in bullet points. And I'm gonna give you guys three minutes to do so. And after that, I would love for some of you to share what you wrote in the chat. Obviously, no pressure. If nobody wants to share, that's totally okay, but I'll give you guys a, uh, an opportunity to do so. Would love to just get a collaborative vibe going. But for now, I'll give you guys three minutes to answer the question, what is the goal of college? Again, make sure to type or write this down because it's going to come into play later on. Um, but for now, I don't know about you guys, but I do the best thing, my best thinking um, with lo-fi beats. So that's what we're going to do today. So here's three minutes. I'll see you guys soon.
All right, that's three minutes. Um, I hope you guys were able to do a little bit of introspection. I know it's not always easy, but I hope you guys are able to write some stuff down. So are any of you willing to share a little bit of what you wrote or one or two point, um, points of what you wrote in the chat? Okay, cool. I'm seeing some here. Okay, I'll read a few out loud if you guys don't mind. So um, here from, I think, Talon is the goal of college is to educate students and give them opportunities that will help them later with work experience and possible internships. I want to go to college in order to gain a degree, which will hopefully help me later in on with the career I choose. Yes, definitely. I think um, to understand this and see college in the bigger picture of it being a foundation, right, is something that should take you towards where you want to go. And it should be something that um, is, uh, is giving you the tools to have the life that you want. Um, I know there's some focus here on professional um, growth, but that's, that's really important, right? Your professional growth is important and your college career uh, should be able to, to give you those tools. That's great. Um, here we have new experiences, um, new found knowledge about topics I actually care about, meet new people, create new connections, relationships, independence, and individualism. I love all those things. I feel that. I definitely, all the things I was thinking about in college, in high school as well. Uh, better or fresh knowledge to learn what interests you have. Um, wow, you guys are killing it here. I love this. Um, new memories, undergo positive experiences. This is all super good. And feel free to take a look at the chat for inspiration if you want to add some of this stuff that other people have wrote down onto your list of what is the goal of college. So keep that as a, its own list, right? Um, I want you guys to have this, what is the goal of college in bullet point form in its own list and just put, you know, leave that alone for now. It's, we're going to come back to it, but um, make sure to have that because we're going to dive into the next question. Um, but for now, I'm going to dive into the answers that the founders of Minerva came up with when they were asking themselves this exact same question, which is, what is the goal of college? And for them, they came up with four answers, which is to develop graduates that are leaders, innovators, broad thinkers, and global citizens. For them, this was what the purpose of Minerva was going to be, was that they were going to train students to become these four things. Um, and so that's, that's an example from the Minerva founders themselves. And we're going to dive into the next question here which is what is preventing colleges from currently helping you achieve these goals? So this is, again, very personal. I think this is something that's gonna come down to what you currently understand about colleges. When you are thinking about the goals that you guys have wrote down for that first list, what is currently stopping you from getting there? What are some barriers that you're seeing as you're doing your research onto different colleges? What's going on? Why is it seem difficult? Why is it not seem extremely you know, easy or whatever else it is? What are the barriers that are currently preventing colleges from helping you get there, get to where you want to be? Um, so again, I'm gonna give you guys three minutes. Would love to hear some of your thoughts right afterwards, but make sure to have its own separate list of what are some barriers that you are seeing uh, or you've seen other people tell you about in the world of colleges and universities and what are they to help to you specifically to uh, blocking you from reaching the goals that you wrote in your first list? So again, we're going to bring back Lo-Fi Beats, and I'm going to see you guys in just three minutes.
All right. So that is three minutes. I would love to have some of you share, if you're willing, in the chat, uh, what you think are currently, colleges are currently, uh, what barriers, sorry, are currently um, presented to you um, to help you, prevent you from achieving those goals. Um, let's see. So, okay. So from Mia, it seems like for you, there are, you have interests that um, aren't really compatible with sort of revenue or money generating or income generating, so to say, um, careers and then are considered hobbies. Um, and it's then really about striking that balance. Wow, that's really actually really insightful and something that I actually haven't heard in one of these sessions. So thank you for sharing that. Um, let's see, the cost, competition to gain attention for admissions, totally um, cause discouragement keeping a high uh, GPA, SAT score, totally um, GPA, um, financial, political viewpoints, money, price of college, rigor of classes, acceptance rate, working up to the test, only about money. Yes, all of these are very, very important um, and all very real. And again, this is all really context dependent, right? It's so different for everyone, what the different barriers look like. Um, and so again, please keep this as a separate list. We're gonna come back to it later in the next part. But um, this is all very helpful. You know, now we're breaking down the issue of, um, of how we can achieve the goals. And I promise it's all gonna come into play in just a little bit. Um, but I'm gonna jump into the sort of barriers that the Minerva founders found when they were thinking about and they were looking at the world of higher education in the United States. <laughs> Specifically, what barriers are holding students back from becoming those four things that they identified in the beginning, the four goals of leaders, um, innovators, global thinkers, and um, broad thinkers, sorry, and global citizens. And for them, um, they came up with some pretty interesting findings. Uh, for them, they found that actually a campus was holding students back from um, achieving those goals. So although campuses are very, very comfortable and sometimes very nice, um, they were really creating this bubble that didn't allow students to uh, be exposed to perspectives and worlds and stories that weren't familiar to them. Um, actually, only about 7% of students in the US travel abroad, um, and 50% of them go to Europe. And so, as we can tell, most students are not going outside of where they stay for the whole, whole four years. And even if they are, they're mostly going to one part of the entire globe. And the world is much, much bigger than Europe, as we all know. And so they found that at least to achieve their goal of developing broad thinkers and global citizens, a campus was actually holding them back. Another thing they found that was quite interesting was that lectures were actually holding students back from genuine learning. Um, so they found through a lot of studies that um, students only retain about 5% of what is taught in a lecture after two years. Um, and so that means by the time you graduate university and college, you probably don't really remember anything from your freshman year, which is not a surprise really to anyone. Um, I think anyone who's gone through college will say that they don't really remember most of what they learned in college. And that's just a generally accepted practice. But obviously, if you're paying a ton of money for an education that's supposed to set you up for a career, you probably want to remember the things you're learning, right? Um, and speaking of costs, they also found that the costs, which a lot of you identified, is a huge barrier for our students to get through to college. Uh, costs in uh, college tuition costs in the US, along with other college associated fees, has rise insanely in the past few decades. This is something I'm sure you guys are thinking a lot about, talking a lot about, unfortunately. Um, but these are three barriers that our founders um, identified when they were looking at uh, what was preventing students currently from reaching the four goals that they identified. Again, keep your list, um, and that's going to be helpful in just a second. Um, but in this next question, I love, again, your participation in this. And I know this one's a little bit confusing, so let me explain a little bit of what this is. So. With this question, I'd love for you guys, I'm gonna just edit it here directly. Uh, I'd love for you guys to tell me when you're thinking about college, what do you think are the main components that college cannot exist without? And let me explain with an example. So personally for me, I think professors um, or faculty is an essential component or core component of college of a college education. Um, and what we're gonna do here is list about four or five core college components um, that we think are very necessary and then we're going to um, be creative and innovate each specific component 
uh, to see what they can look like in creative manner to achieve our goals. So, but before we get there, I'd love to know in the chat from some of you, um, what do you think are some other core college components? Like these are the essential pieces of university and college that uh, need to have, like that must be there regardless of who's attending, what you're studying or whatever else. Um, students, cool. All right, I'm seeing students. I'm gonna say peers, right? Um, okay, dorms, yeah, somewhere to, to live, like residents. <laughs> Um, I saw an education. Okay, I'm gonna say yes, definitely. Let's say, let's say academics, curriculum. Um, let's do one more. Um, I'm gonna say social network is kind of among peers and students. Resources, library, books. Okay, I'm gonna use that one. Let's say um, academic resources, right? How about that? Um, academic slash student resources. So these are great guys. These are fantastic core college components. And so what we're going to do in this next section, I'm going to give you guys a few more minutes with this one. This is where we're going to pull back the two lists that you made a little bit earlier. And what we're going to do is I'm going to have you guys look at those goals that you identified in the very beginning, in the front, uh, uh, in the beginning of this, um, this, I guess, process, and then put it right next to the barriers that you identified. Okay. And then I want you guys to write these five core components down or type it down wherever you have and put them all side by side. And what we're going to do is you're going to spend the next five minutes um, going through every single one of these core components, right? And thinking, how can you create these core components um, and make them and imagine them to overcome the barriers you identified and reach the goals that you identified? For example, um, for professors and faculty, right? Um, how can you overcome the, like, what do the professors look like? What do, where are they? What are they teaching? How accessible are they? What do they, what does this part of university and college looks like to help you overcome those barriers that you identified and reach the goals that you identified? And then after you come up with some ideas, you written it down, you go down to the students. What's the student body like? What are your peers like? What are your interactions like? And then you do the same with the dorm and then the residents, um, academics, uh, student resources, so um, I hope that makes sense. Do you guys have any questions? I'm gonna just give like 10 seconds. If anyone has any questions, you can feel free to drop it in the chat. I'm just a little nervous this part's confusing, but I hope I was able to explain it properly. But I'll give it 10 seconds to see, does anyone have any questions in regards to what I'm asking you guys to do with this last section? Because it is tends to be the, the most important one. Or you can just put up like a thumbs down if you're like, Ben, I'm confused. <laughs> and I can try to explain it again. Or maybe a thumbs up if you if you feel good about it. If you're ready to go. Yeah, I can do that. Sure, I can explain it one more time. So essentially, the point I can explain it through a perspective of um, what the point of this is, right? So the point of the design thinking process is to just throw away your assumptions about university. So currently, we all know what a traditional campus looks like in regards to these five core components. We know that professors teach in front of a lecture hall. They usually live near campus and they at least work on the campus themselves. The student body also does the same thing. They live on campus most of the time or near campus. You guys are going to classes together. Um, a lot of times you're engaging with each other through clubs and social scenes um, with dorms. There's a lot of dorms on campus themselves or off campus with academics. You know, they're taught through lectures. They're, you know, you're graded through exams and such and such. And lastly, your resources usually are surrounding in are, are in libraries or in um, or in um, in uh, career centers or whatever else. And these are the current assumptions that we're making, right? But what I want you guys to do in this current one is to throw away all those assumptions, which actually is extremely difficult. And so, how we're going to go about it is to just not think about what a university looks like at the moment. What you're going to do is imagine that you have unlimited resources. You have all the money in the world, the smartest people in the world next to you. And what you're going to do is work with them, go down list point by point to figure out, okay, if I could make the professors and faculty at this university, and they're the smartest, or they're exactly who I want to be, um, who are they? What do they do at your school? Um, and how are they teaching? And all of these things to answer these questions based on the goals that you identified and to avoid the barriers that you identified. And then you do that for students. 
What do the student body look like? How do they interact with each other? How am I interacting with the student body? What are they doing to oh, help me overcome those barriers I identified and to reach the goals that I want to do? How can the student body help me get to where I want to be um, based on the goals I identified? And then the same for dorms, same for academics, and same for resources. Um, I hope that's clear. Um, so you link the with the answers from the first question. Yeah, so really the first two lists that you made, the sort of goals that you identified and the barriers that you identified should be the sort of um, guiding principles for how you re-envision what the each of these core components can look like. And so by the end of these five minutes, I hope you guys will have this ideal college where you say, okay, in my ideal college, all the professors are, um, you know, they hold a lot of office hours and I have really close connections with them because I think professors are gonna help me get internships that will set me up for careers. The student body is extremely diverse from all over the world because I want to gain cultural experiences and have friends from different cultures. I want dorms that are, um, skyscrapers so I have the most beautiful views so then I can um you know live a luxurious lifestyle or whatever else so that's kind of the idea that I'm getting at with these questions I hope that's clear um but either way we're gonna dive in and give you guys five minutes for this one I want you guys to get creative with it the professors could be you know flying and you know you could be getting around to the dorms in like tell through teleportation or whatever obviously you don't have to do that but the whole point is that I want you guys to get a little bit creative because I think so much we are bogged down by what already exists that we are afraid to 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 dream and I just want you guys with this one um, get creative with it get innovative with it use your imagination but really try to center it on what the goals of college is that you wrote for yourself imagine you could design the perfect university just for you and I would love to know what that looks like so let's dive into those five minutes a little bit more lo-fi beats this time and I'll see you guys in five minutes
Oh, that was a very abrupt <laughs> ending to that audio, but that was five minutes. And I hope you guys had some time to get creative with the five core components. Um, and I love for some of you, you're willing to share on what, you know, one or two of the looks, what one or two of the components can look like in the chat. I already see some people sharing. I'll read them out loud. Okay, the practice professors being so practical with what they're teaching the student body um, and being engaging with academic resources. Um, and uh, let's see, um, being adequate and useful. Cool. Professors and faculty providing extra help on topics that I don't quite understand. Um, peers, kind of respectful differences, uh, close knit community, allowing networks and connections. Awesome. Um, let's see, ideal college has professors that take part in student activities and are personal in clubs and activities. Cool. I'm seeing a lot of really cool ones here. Um, didn't see anyone saying their professors um, can fly, but that's, it's just a little bit disappointing, but that's okay. I see that you guys are taking a pragmatic approach, which is great. Uh, but yes, okay, hopefully, I, I want you guys to keep this list, right? These things are actually super helpful, not necessarily because there is an exact university out there that fits every single one of your criteria, but maybe there is, you know, even if there isn't, you could use this checklist, you can bring it to your counselor, you can bring it to your friends, you can bring it to people who are older, who've gone through college, and show them this list and think, ask them, like, do you know of any colleges that hits these points? You know, ask them, these are the things I'm looking for. Um, and also, when you're talking to university representatives uh, or alumni or admissions officers, you can say, okay, you can ask them directly, like, what are your professors like? What are your student body like? What are the dorms like? What resources do you offer? And just do that and check it against the list that you have in front of you right now, because that's going to be really great. And again, like I mentioned in the beginning, if you are applying, when you are applying for a university or a college program, you can say, okay, why do I want to go to just your college? Because your college offers um, a faculty that is really involved in the student body. And that's exactly what I'm looking for. That's something I've known for a long time. And um, knowing that about your program makes me very interested. And so being specific like that is going to be really helpful. And I hope you guys are able to use this list as you're going forward in both your college search, your college application process, and at the end, hopefully your college selection process. Um, and so um, to give you guys a little bit of a recap on what we just did, this is the design thinking process where we define the goal and the problem, we broke it into the main component pieces, and then we took a look at the component pieces and twisted them and turned them to think what are the ideal way that this can be done to overcome the problems and reach our goals. Now, I don't know how many of you are going to remember this. If you want to remember this, you can. It's a really great way to kind of come up with innovative solutions in any aspects of life. But um, it's also, you know, maybe you just use it this one time and that's all right. Um, but I want to dive a little bit into some of the solutions and creative solutions that Minerva's founders came up with to overcome the barriers, which uh, to remind you were um, a campus, which were holding students back from global experiences, a lecture, which are holding students back from um, actually memorable and useful uh, education. And lastly, um, the costs, which was uh, really holding students back from just really having access to any of it. And the creative solutions that they came up with to reach the goals, which to remind yourselves, they were leader, global uh, leaders, innovators, broad thinkers, and global citizens, um, was to have our student body travel to seven different countries throughout their four-year undergraduate program. And so I was lucky enough to be able to live in all seven of these cities throughout my four years in undergrad. And throughout these cities, we are traveling with um, the same group of people. We live together, we study together, and we actually engage in local cultural, personal, and professional internship opportunities in every single one of these cities where we leave basically having experienced what it's like to be a local, where everyone has a favorite park, a favorite restaurant, a, a favorite place to go on a Friday night out. Um, and I will say that's extremely been extremely memorable for me and something I'm very grateful for. Um, but also it's designed to help our students consistently challenge what they're learning because you are learning from people who are living very different lives than you in very different cities than you with different stories. And that's really that challenge component to help our students become global thinkers, or global citizens and broad thinkers. And not only are our students being challenged when they step outside of the residence hall in these seven different cities, they're being challenged by their peers. You know, we have an extremely diverse student body. Like I mentioned, my graduating class was like 130 students. 
but over 45 different nationalities represented. We are a US institution, but 88% of our student body comes from um, other countries with, within our entire school. We have over, I think, 100 different nationalities represented in a student body of 650 students. So we are actually constantly being challenged even inside of the residence hall and in our class. And I will say that it is actually super cool to be learning academic concepts that you think you know the right answer, but having somebody else from a completely different country coming with a whole different perspective. Um, and that just makes learning in my perspective and opinion and experience a lot more fun. Uh, in regards to how our professors look like, which is one part that I know we tackle a little bit and you all have now a little bit of an insight into and your own ideas. For us, our professors, we wanted world-class faculty from top institutions that are exclusively focused on student learning. I'm not sure if you guys know this, but a lot of universities around the world are really, really prestigious and well-known, not necessarily because of their undergraduate program, but because of the research that these schools produce. A lot of the best universities around the world are actually research institutions where they have, they give money to scientists and researchers who create new knowledge, which is obviously super important, but um, how they usually incentivize these really smart academics to come work for their school is by saying, we'll give you money and resources to do your research. But on the other hand, you also have to teach, which is why lectures came about because they were so easy, right? Professors could teach to, one professor could teach hundreds of students within an hour or two hours, and then they could just focus on the thing that they're actually passionate about, which is research. But at Minerva, they don't want that. They want students and professors to actually want to be there because they're focused on student learning. And so our, all of our professors are there and at Minerva to actually teach our students because we don't actually offer any research. Um, and what we're teaching our students are also, for us, extremely important. Instead of asking students to memorize on exams um, for stuff that most likely you'll forget, we'll find, we find that the best things that we, our brains can actually learn and retain are soft skills, um, such as critical thinking, creative thinking, effective communication, and effective interaction, which are also the skills that most employers agree are going to be super important in the coming decades. Um, and so what we're teaching is very different. And in regards to getting students into the program, which somebody identified earlier as a barrier, which is that usually it's super competitive, and sometimes it feels like the school doesn't even get to know you for who you are, um, our admissions process does not look at any standardized testing. It's completely knee blind. We don't have any quotas for enrollment caps. And for us, we're really trying to focus on getting to know you and who you are and um, how you think and whether or not you are a good fit for our program. Um, and so we really want to bring in the type of student that both wants to be there and will fit in. And to address the cost barrier that we talked about, we provide need-based financial aid to all of our students, no matter where they come from, whatever their nationality is, and no matter what their demonstrated need is. Um, every Minerva applicants and admit who applies for financial aid, um, we take a look at what their family can contribute and then help them fill the gap um, through low um, income loans, through term time employment or work study and scholarship grants. And actually for you guys um, as NSHSS members, you are all eligible for a $10,000 need-based scholarship. Um, so I know most of you are not seniors, but um, for those who may be, and also for next year, you could definitely look into this as an option for you all. Um, and lastly, again, I know most of you are not seniors, um, but for those who are, we actually are still um, opening or um, we still have application opens for fall 2022. And for those who are not seniors, uh, know that actually our enrollment cycles last much longer than most universities and colleges in the US where we actually have a cycle that goes all the way till March. And so um, this is still enough time to apply and our application is completely free. And in my opinion, honestly, really fun. There's like challenges in there that get to know, test your critical thinking, test your communication skills, test your logical thinking skills. It kind of feels like a little bit of a mental obstacle course. Um, but yeah, so if you are interested in learning more about Minerva, I have five minutes left here. You are feel free to ask me any questions about Minerva or about the design thinking process. I'm also going to follow up with all of you with an email um, with some more information about Minerva and also a lot of upcoming events where you can get to know Minerva through our students, um, other alumni, our faculty and staff. Um, so you guys can have opportunities to learn more if you so wish. But for now, like I mentioned, um, I have five more minutes about um, to answer any questions. 
for, the, for those of you who don't have any questions, thank you so much for your time. I hope you guys are able to gain a little bit of something today that you can take home with you, um, bring to your counselors, bring to the people around you, and help you out with this really exciting, but also I know can be really scary process. So thanks for your time, and I'm going to um, spend the last five minutes answering questions for those who have any questions. All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here.